In 2022, 274 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance and protection. Preventing, mitigating, and responding to humanitarian crises is a challenge. Can fiction and storytelling play a role? Can it raise awareness and motivate action to address the causes and consequences of humanitarian crises? My name is Ruth Mukwana, and I host the Saha podcast, Stories and Humanitarian Action. Welcome to Saha Stories and Humanitarian Action. I have a great show for you, but before I introduce my guest today, I'd like to ask you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, like, comment, and share this video if you like it. My guest today is Alison Tanner. She is a, grad a doctoral graduate of the Department of English and Literary Arts at the University of Denver. Her research interests include historic fiction of the American Old West, community archiving and literacy, especially among communities experiencing homelessness. Her critical work appears in Reflections, a journal of community engaged writing and rhetoric, American Archivist, and Community Literacy Journal, among others. She is the co-host and co-creator of the When You Are Homeless podcast miniseries, and a member of the editorial collective for the CODA section of Community Literacy Journal. She has an MFA in fiction from Benning Co College, and that is where we met. And her collection of short stories, Defensible Spaces, is forthcoming with Tory House Press. Welcome to the show, Alison. Thank you so much, Ruth. I'm so excited to be here. I'm a, I'm a longtime listener of your podcast. Thank you, and I'm so excited to have the opportunity to speak with you. And um, I want to talk about the essay in a minute, but first I did want to ask you about your writing. I know you're a writer. I've read some of your work, uh, some of your short stories, and tell me more or tell us more about your writing career. Yeah, thanks. It's always fun to talk about writing. Um, I, when I met you at Bennington, I was mostly working on short stories, fiction, um, which I continue to work on. Uh, since then, um, I, I did that doctoral degree and I've been doing a lot more academic writing. Um, as, as you said, really interested in community archiving, community literacy, so finding ways to bring in, through research, through academic research, finding ways to bring in communities that often don't have a voice in academic discourse. Um, as you also mentioned, um, right now I'm focusing largely on communities experiencing homelessness, um, particularly in Denver, where I'm, where I'm based. Um, I'm also kind of starting to think about memoir writing and forms of nonfiction writing. Um, so I'm really interested. I, I love how your podcast focuses on fiction because um, it makes me kind of re-remember why I value fiction and why I like kind of start and always return to fiction. I think I have been straying a little bit. <laughs> um, so it's, I, I really love your podcast for that reason, among others. No, and you know, I'm really a big proponent of fiction. If I could just turn everyone on fiction, um, I would. And congratulations um, on your short stories, which are Thank forthcoming. Um, would you be able to share a little bit about what these stories are about? Yeah, I would love to. Um, they, I've been working on them for about 10 years. Um, they take, they're based on a town, the town where I grew up in the mountains of Colorado, and they are, um, they're connected short stories. So um, they kind of follow a few characters as they grow up in this mountain town. And it's, it's really exploring um, growing up as girls among wildness and wilderness, and kind of how to be wild in wilderness. And there's also um, a theme of forest fires, the sort of always a threat of fire, uh, which kind of affects characters literally and metaphorically. Um, it's kind of it's kind of always coming, and you never know when. Yeah, yeah and maybe I'd love to talk to you about you know, these stories once they are out, because again, one of you know, as you know, to me, the podcast is really around raising awareness on humanitarian crisis and then also motivating action and trying to explore how can fiction 
uh, do that and if it can at all. And of course, listening to you talk about forests and, and fires, my mind is going like, oh goodness, I'd love to talk more about that. But congratulations, and I really can't wait um, to read um, your collection of short stories. You also have a podcast um, that you've co-created on, um, it's called When You Are Homeless. Could you just speak a little bit about what you are trying to do with that podcast? Yeah, so that podcast actually did complete, it was a mini series, um, a few, uh, I believe 2019, um, it did complete, so it was um, a set number of episodes. And in that podcast, I worked with um, my co-host, Blake Sons, a really wonderful um, creative person also. Um, he and I interviewed people experiencing homelessness, and then we made a podcast afterwards with the interviews. Um, so we, we, um, we kind of each, every other episode is a narrator just telling their story. They have the mic telling their story. And in between, Blake and I meet and kind of discuss themes that we found among all of the interviews. Um, so really trying to just point out the complexity of life with people experiencing homelessness. There's an episode on art, um, there's an episode on trauma, um, there's an episode on the bureaucracy of homelessness, which actually is kind of similar to the essay I think you and I will talk about today. Um, I'm pretty interested in bureaucracy, as boring as it sounds. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's actually kind of fascinating. You talk about uh, bureaucracies, and I'm glad you mentioned that and uh, that you're also doing work just unpacking that because it's such a big word. Um, it is so, you know, it's so overwhelming in many ways, but sometimes I also think they are made of people and individuals. It's how do you kind of look at that as an entity, but remember they are made uh, of people. Suddenly, you know, as you, you may know in New York as well, homelessness um, is a big challenge here. And again, maybe at the end, I'll also just share some information about this podcast so that if anyone is interested in listening to it, they could do that. I want to ease into your essay, and you've kind of mentioned it because a big part of uh, the essay is really around the bureaucracy around the asylum seeking process. The essay itself is autological archive, appraisal, institutional motives, and essentializing identity in refugee and asylum application narratives in and out of fiction. And I have so many questions, and it's interesting to me as I was reading your essay, because I'm always wondering, you know, does fiction, do stories really teach? Do they educate? And for me, reading your essay and looking at these stories, I frankly learned so much. And I'm like, yeah, actually, <laughs> there is a role for fiction in, in educating. But tell me, what is the um, hypothesis in your essay? Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear you learned something because <laughs> it's always hard to know what happens with these academic essays. So that's exciting to hear. Um, what I'm exploring in this essay is the ways in which fiction can inform how we understand archives. Um, specifically here, how fiction about the refugee and asylum process, how um, fiction can make visible processes in the bureaucracy that maybe are overlooked um, elsewhere. Um, so I'm, I'm arguing that, and, and so the autologic part in the, in the really wordy title, now that you say it out loud, I'm like, hmm, I could have done better than that. Um, the autologic function that I'm, I'm pointing out here is that as bureaucracy builds, as people apply for asylum and refugee status in the United States, those who are accepted for asylum create an archive of accepted um, people to resettle that then informs who is accepted later. Um, so it's, it's kind of responding to this fact that less than 1% of refugees who apply for asylum in the United States um, are, are invited to resettle. And so I'm kind of asking, what about those 99% of other people? And on paper, how, how does that 1%, how are the way their stories are told on paper? How does that um, predict 
the kind of stories that will be selected in the future to resettle, to be invited to resettle. Right, and I was actually going to ask you um, to explain to me what is autological archive, because this is the first time <laughs> I've ever come across this term. Absolutely. I would think it would be the first time because I, I did kind of make up the term. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't make up the word autologic. I did look it up to make sure it is a word. <laughs> um, basically, what I the way I am using it is um, like it, like thinking of, say, the word automatic, where something is going on its own. If there's an autologic function, it's um, like the archive is almost thinking for itself. Like, as you said, people are the ones doing bureaucracy, but what I'm arguing is that um, people are influenced by the stories they see in previous previous iterations of the archive. Um, so they, the stories they are reading of accepted people and of people who have been accepted and invited to resettle are informing the stories they're looking for. And so in that way, the stories that exist are sort of predicting the stories that will come. So it's sort of automated. Right, right. No, and I really get that. No, no, I do. Okay. <laughs> and I'm just thinking back when I used to, for a short time, I think for a couple of years, I did work for UNHCR. And I, as I was reading the essay itself, and you do touch upon bias a little bit, but in terms of what you're looking at um, and how that influences and perhaps sometimes one is not aware of how that history or past of what you've looked at in terms of who's been accepted and who's been rejected and then how that influences the asylum seeker in front of you. Yeah. So, and, and one of the things that, um, of course, I'm very excited, you know, in reading the essay itself is because, of course, the link for me with storytelling, and 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 I think you you do quite a clear job of articulating like the application process. As you're interviewing an asylum seeker, you're looking for certain information, and I think when you look at even the form itself and the kind of words it uses, and how that actually veers away from what is storytelling if you allowed an asylum seeker to tell their stories. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I want to make sure I get the wording right. Um, <laughs> in, in the essay, I, I use for one example of many. Um, as an aside, there are at least 20 steps to a process to apply for asylum in the United States. So, these, so people applying are, are asked to tell their story over and over and over again. I'll just kind of start with that. One of these forms is called the I-589. And among many other bits of information, applicants are asked to, I might just read a part of it for you, asked to quote, provide a detailed and specific account of the basis of your claim to asylum or other protection. To the best of your ability, provide specific dates, places, and description about each event or action described. Um, so in the essay, I think about the differences between the words account, descriptions, and responses, and how they're different from narrative or story, um, and, and also in ways that maybe they're not different. Um, how can you describe what happened to you without it being your story? Um, and, and kind of what would, these, what would these forms look like if it said, tell us your story, rather than provide an account? Um, and I do, and when I think you also made a point around trauma, when someone is speaking about trauma, how do you really logically um, talk about trauma uh, in a way that actually um, speaks and I guess protects you from the trauma of it. But when someone is really looking for very, I guess, legal, um, ways of looking at trauma and how that can also be another challenge within the process itself. Absolutely. And I would add um, sort of this whole the setup here, asking someone to write these very traumatic experiences. I mean, first of all, it's hard to write about trauma. So asking that of someone is can be a violation, depending on who you are. Secondly, writers work for years and years to learn how to effectively write about trauma. 
you know, like you and I went to graduate school for yes. writing <laughs> and you can't like not everyone who's applying for asylum is going has been to graduate school for writing. So it's sort of asking in a way it's asking the impossible, like write, write, um, write a story that helps me understand what you went through. Um, and again, people work their whole lives to be able to do that and to ask to be do that in 10 minutes or however long people have the form, depending on the situation is, um, is a pretty complicated situation. You're absolutely right. I mean, if you're looking at the trauma of sexual violence, I still struggle to really write about that trauma. And I tend to find for my characters who are going to do that, frankly, I normally escape and kind of say mention it, but not really get into into it. Um, but at the same time, reading your essay, it doesn't seem to be the right way, quote unquote, because even if you're very... Um, sort of just saying this is what happened from A to Z, there is also a sense that given the culture that um, different people are coming from, that perhaps even that is not accepted for them to talk about that trauma that way. And the expectation is that they actually don't talk about it. And I think you made this point around uh, some of the applications uh, from female, from women um, asylum seekers and rape. And uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, that's some research by a scholar named Inderpal Grewal. Um, and she looks at um, uh, Sikh women applying for asylum in the 1990s. And um, many Sikh women had experienced sexual violence. Um, and it got to the point that as, um, because so many were seeking asylum, there kind of became this, this genre of the rape narrative where women were kind of put in this position to, to, to have to choose. Now, do I, do I apply with my rape narrative or do I apply with my political asylum? Because I have both. But there were these two, because um, possibly they weren't, they hadn't experienced sexual violence. But it had sort of become, if you're a Sikh woman applying for asylum right now, you probably need a, a rape narrative. It's sort of what was starting to happen. And that kind of comes back to that autologic part. Um, yeah. Because what other kinds of needs for asylum are erased? If, um, if there's kind of one story, kind of the Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie caution about yeah. one story, if there's one story, um, what, what else, what is erased and what kind of freedom does someone have to to tell their own story. Yeah, and absolutely. And I, you also made that point um, in the essay around agency then, because it's actually it's one thing I was discussing uh, with colleagues at work um, in terms of how we really tell stories of people in humanitarian need. And you kind of pick one part of the life depending on what it is um, and with good intentions that we are trying to advocate for. But then maybe the person really wants to talk about other aspects of their life. Maybe they want to talk about surviving this trauma. And so how does the process in many ways take that agency away from the asylum seekers? Mm, that's such a good question. I think it goes back to that 1% of accepted applications. So if you, it's, it, I mean, that's, that's a pretty competitive process. Um, and it's almost like people are put in this possession position to have, um, to be most at risk, most physically at risk, to be most at risk in the kind of way that they think their audience expects them to be at risk in order to be invited for asylum. And I'm sure we'll get there, but some of the novels that I use in the essay really kind of slow down and show um, this process. Yeah, and, and actually maybe this is a good point to get into some of the stories. And because you're talking about, I guess, embellishment, <laughs> this is one of the, um, when I was looking at uh, your analysis of Imbolo Mbue's book, Behold the Dreamers, which is such an incredible book. Um, and here, I think one of the points you're making in your essay is around this element of embellishing risk. Uh, 
And so maybe through that book, you could speak a little bit about more how the characters in this book, uh, John Does Family, how they are actually forced to embellish their stories. And I did also like the character Bubaka, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, how he profits uh, from actually uh, this process. Yeah, I love this book too. So Behold the Dreamers is about um, a family, the Janga family, and they are immigrants from Cameroon. Um, and basically what happens is they have a temporary work visa and that visa runs out, but they really want to stay in the United States. So they find this lawyer named U Ubakar, Babakar, <laughs> um, and um, he, he advises them to lie on their application. He, he advises them to um, say you feel your life is threatened if you return to Cameroon. Um, he advises um, the, the man in the relationship to say he fears that his, his girlfriend's father will murder him if he returns to Cameroon, which isn't true. He's angry at him, but he has no, he would never murder him. Mm -hmm. um, so the lawyer advises that they create all this evidence, that they get letters showing that prove that he is um, physically at risk and that kind of creates a history, uh, a documented false history of, of his, um, uh, his physical threat. Um, ultimately, they decide not to do this. Spoiler, I suppose. <laughs> Apologies. Um, but what I kind of look at in the essay, I'll try not to spoil the ending too much more, is um, I look at, okay, so what, what happened with that sort of partial archive, those applications that the family started, um, that says that someone, a man, an immigrant from Cameroon is afraid to return to his country because he thinks his father-in-law will kill him. So that kind of feeds a narrative of violence in Cameroon that isn't true, but it's documented now. Um, and again, that plugs into sort of the, the autologic archive because that's, that's, that's feeding this narrative of what happens in Cameroon and why people might be seeking asylum from Cameroon and so on. Yeah, and I, 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 I've read um, a sentence in there, I think where you said, and I'll ask you to just talk a little bit about what you mean by it. Anam's rest within application narrative storytelling. Mm. Yeah. So that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up too. Um, basically, the more, it's like the more um, the stories are full of violence and terror and people are more, um, can really prove how physically at risk they are if they return to a country or in the country they are in, um, the more that readers expect that kind of story. And so then writers, applicants, have to kind of exceed the reader's expectations and sort of shock them into seeing me above the 99% of other applicants. Um, and we might, so it kind of it builds and it's sort of a call and response um, between readers and applicants. Um, I don't know if you were ready to transition into the other novel, but we see that really well in um, Dinam and Guest's yes. How to Read the Air. Yeah, yeah I was just going to actually say this is a good moment to talk about Dinam Mengistu's How to Read the Air because it really builds on, on the point uh, that we are discussing now. And maybe you could just uh, continue to explore that. Yeah. Um, so this novel was written in 2010. Um, and this is about a man named Jonas, and he, his parents were refugees from Ethiopia. He, um, the narrator, was born in the United States. Um, he works at a refugee resettlement agency in New York City. Uh, yeah, New York City. And part of his job is literally to take these applicant application narratives and to um, embellish them. His boss, um, I might read a quote I prepared to, um, uh, let's see, he says, he describes these narratives as having, quote, a cold, almost hard pragmatism with similar endings in which the consequences were always the same. We, I, can't, won't, will never be able to go back. Um, so he's, he's identifying this sort of, um, and he, he himself as a character gets kind of, kind of bored reading these narratives because it's the same thing. So there's this, it's this deep irony of these 
these experiences that for people living, many people living in the United States are impossibly traumatic and feel like, like many of us can't experience or can't, and it's difficult for many of us to imagine what the people are going through when they're seeking asylum. Um, yet he becomes bored with them because they're similar. Yeah. Um, then his boss literally asks him to, or to more directly um, make them the same, basically. Um, is it, I might read another quote from that, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So Jonas says, I quickly discovered as well that what could not be researched could just as easily be invented based on common assumptions that most of us shared when it came to the poor in distant foreign countries. My boss put it to me this way once. When you think about it, it's all really the same story. All we're doing is just changing around the names of the countries, sometimes the religion, but after that, there's not much difference. It was his suggestion that I borrow from one story to feed another. No one will ever know the difference, he said. Um, and so this, um, this novel is fascinating because Jonas is like, there's, he's never, um, like this work, happens without any sort of punishment really he he does end up leaving this job but he's not fired because he's changed these narratives and as far as the reader knows these application narratives um remain archived um with these embellishments and these edits from from an, a person who whose story it was not <laughs> um yeah. though jonas is punished so to speak punished later um through just kind of in this, in his life's, um, like in the path of the novel and other um, aspects of the novel that uh, kind of weave in and out of his work at this uh, resettlement agency. Yeah, and as, as you were reading um, that quote from from the book itself, and again, looking at what your essay is, is really sort of interrogating. Um, and the book, um, one of the reasons I love fiction is that we are able to talk about fiction and, and the characters who are really fictionalized characters, but in an honest way. Um, because when the, the you know when the character says, "Oh, you know, if you think about it, it's really the same story," you're kind of going like, "No, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's no, no one who has the same story mm -hmm. ever." <laughs> right, and because it's in fiction, we can read that as ironically. Correct. Right. I think we know we know that it, because of its context, it's ironic. Whereas if someone perhaps said that on TV, it might be ironic, but the but the character wouldn't find or the person wouldn't find it ironic. So, you know. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And and the other story then is um, Chimamanda's um, the American Embassy. Again, another great story. Um, and here, actually, before we before we get into it, I don't know if you're able to read. Um, the, the summary of the advice the protagonist is given um, when you start off the part on this story, because I, I was just so blown away by that advice. Yeah, yeah, I do have that here. Um, so just for a little bit of context, this is a short story, um, and the narrator is never named, and she is waiting in line um, to seek asylum um, at the American embassy in Nigeria. Um, so I will read and, and as she's in line and the days up to her seeking asylum she is given advice from her community and people around her so I'll read from the essay that section before her interview Adichie's protagonist is given unsolicited advice for how to shape her asylum story the doctor she sees quote refused to give her any more tranquilizers because she needed to be alert for the visa interview end quote the man near her in line advises if you make a mistake, don't correct yourself because they will assume you are lying. And at her son's funeral, people recommend that she not falter when answering questions. Quote, tell them all about Ugana, who is her son, what he was like, but don't overdo it because every day people lie to them to get asylum visas about dead relatives that were never even born. Make Ugana real, cry, but don't cry too much. Whatever you do, the advice seems to be, don't say how you really feel about your situation. I guess when I, 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 I mean, all the three stories, um, you know, they, they, they raise so many questions, but this one perhaps for me was more heartbreaking in many ways um, because he has a mother who's lost her son. 
And yet the advice she's being given is don't grieve, don't really talk so much about that loss. But at the same time, in the essay, you also talk about the, the culture um, of the person who is interviewing the protagonist and how she would actually take um, what if this character, if this protagonist shares more of herself and how she would mourn. And maybe you could talk more about that as well. Yeah, so um, when uh, the protagonist is at, finally gets to the front of the line after hours of waiting, um, she's face to face with a, a white woman who's interviewing her. Um, um, and I'll just kind of read a quote here. Um, the protagonist, quote, realized that she would die gladly at the hands of the man in the black hooded shirt before she said a word about Ugana to this interviewer. Um, so she realizes, um, like basically when she's she's face to face with this stranger who um, knows nothing about her story or her culture, she realizes she doesn't want to tell her about how her son was killed. Um, there's a there's a detail about palm oil. Um, I think the narrator thinks she she compares the blood that she saw in this traumatic event to palm oil, and she realizes this person interviewing me probably doesn't know what palm oil is, so can't really appreciate that that metaphor. Um, and that's sort of a bridge that makes her realize I'm not sure this person interviewing me can understand my story at all. Yeah, I found it like a really powerful. Um story to be honest and again as I was saying earlier I I've, I've read the essay three times um and uh I it really made me think a lot about the process and to me it was a very great way of uh, making visible these challenges um around who, who I guess in many ways who has access to asylum and who doesn't and how do how these stories um, are then sort of kind of influence that process? Yeah, and it, I mean, it. One other piece that I actually didn't write about in this essay, but that I've been working with since, is this notion of impossible archival imaginaries, um, which is an idea created or um, kind of generated by uh, um, Michelle Caswell. Mm -hmm. and uh, Gilliland, and Gilliland, two scholars, and it's basically, they, they really talk about how an archive can shape how we think about things, even if that archive is impossible. So with refugee and asylum narratives, um, we, we like can't gather them all together and point out, look, here's the bias, like for reasons for privacy and safety, we can't access them as outsiders but also for reasons of them being thrown away or being destroyed or just made inaccessible. We, we can't access them. So we are kind of like, what I'm trying to do with this essay is not to point fingers and be like, hey, everyone has a bias, like this is a problem. I think we all know that we all have biases, yes. but my, my hope is to just like um, keep, keep us questioning these processes and um, like, I guess just really thinking about these situations like if you have a woman talking to a man about her sexual abuse is she going to tell her story differently than if she's speaking to a woman and and I, i'm sure that i know that there are um in some cases people are working very very hard to address these kinds of um situations making sure there are translators and women if a woman wants to speak to a woman but not in all cases um and layers of our biases are so deep, especially when we've been reading other applications that tell us who we think should be invited yeah. to be settled. Yeah. And again, I think part of it as well, and you're absolutely right, I, you know, it's not, you know, and you made this point throughout the essay, this is not criticizing um, uh, officials, you know, uh, managing and, and handling this uh, application process who are doing, of course, a lot of work and, and wanting to do good and, and right work. But it's just much more around questioning and, 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 and I guess encouraging us or inviting us to, to, to think um, a bit. But the other thing, uh, as I was reading your, your, your story, and it's coming up a lot, to me it's also around agency. Um, you know, how do we give refugees, people affected by crisis, agency, 
and actually so that they're empowered to tell their stories. Um, we talked a bit about trauma and again, you know, a lot of research, you know, shows that most people would rather block trauma out uh, when it happens. And so again, just understanding that and just knowing that people are not perhaps necessarily like to be able to account what happened blow by blow. Um, and at the same time, if there was some agency and a way of helping them to tell their stories, that could be another, I guess that's something else we could do. But I also know you are doing some work on this, working with refugees uh, to help them to tell their stories. And maybe you could share about that as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I have been training with this organization called the Her Story Writers Network. And this is a memoir, a method of facilitating memoir workshops. Um, it's been it's been working for about 25 years. Um, it's been kind of activated in prisons and in schools. I, I also was able to do it in some shelters. Um, but it, I have been um, leading these virtual workshops with people living in refugee camps. Um, for just these kind of one-off workshops because of technology. It's it, unfortunately we can't do the weekly um, writing group in kind of the, the traditional way, um, right. but it will be a, a one-off, a, a, usually like a two-hour workshop um, with people who are connected to a education program called Jesuit Worldwide Learning, which is an online learning program for people living in refugee camps um, around the world. They have sites, um, I'm not sure how many sites they have, but many. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty amazing. I um, facilitate this Her Story method of memoir writing which isn't fiction, <laughs> um, but it, it's um, in this in this method of memoir writing. It's very very conscious about trauma, and it's very mm -hmm. it's, it prioritizes people telling what they want to tell, right. like having having agency, like you said, and um, it's never like tell your deepest trauma or something. It's it's really what do you want to write about? What do you want to share with other people? Um, so I lead these one these one off workshops, and then I for writers who want to continue and if you do um we correspond over email and mm -hmm. i just offer feedback on what they're writing um and a few a few writers are have very nearly complete drafts and soon mm -hmm. um i hope to be able to share them on the her story uh website yeah now alison this really brings me to the end of uh our conversation of course <laughs> <laughs> I could talk to you uh, all day about this. It's it's, it's 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 interesting. It's 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 work you're doing that makes me very curious, and I am just so glad that you're doing it, and it has a very strong impact as well. Um, but I don't know if you have any questions for me. Um, <laughs> I mean, I I really love your project. I'll just preface some questions by saying I really love your project because. I feel like the way you bring in fiction, um, like sometimes you're analyzing these fictional stories and showing how they're relevant. And other times you're bringing in people who are not writers, but read fiction. And I love how you will ask someone, what, what are pieces of fiction that you think helps explain or relates to the work you do? And so this merging work you're doing is so important and fascinating. Um, obviously I could talk to you for a really long time also <laughs> about your work. Um, I would be curious to hear, um, you talk about fiction a bit more and why you love fiction and sort of, um, what you think it does that other genres can't do given this focus you're working with. Yeah. And <laughs> I could talk all day about this <laughs> and part of the, um, the joy of doing the project as well is I get to hear a lot of different perspectives. But the one thing that strikes me about fiction, maybe there's so many elements, but I really like the idea that it's fiction and that I can escape from whatever is happening. Uh, while for me, nonfiction, you, you cannot escape. And even if we were having a conversation about your memoir, for example, I would be careful to criticize elements of, of someone's memoir. While if, if we're talking about characters, fictionalized characters, I feel it's a kind of safe space 
to have on honest conversations. I feel like it's easy not to like a character. And <laughs> right, say, you're allowed to say like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's a really good point. <laughs> right, he's like that can even be a compliment. This character's a terrible right? person. Yeah. That can be a compliment to the writer. <laughs> True. Yeah. No, thank you. I mean, thank you so much for your time. And maybe my final question, or not even a question, is if you'd like to share more information about your podcast and how people could uh, find it, and then we'll end it. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity, Ruth. Um, that podcast, you can find at whenyouarehomeless.com, and it has a website with some photos in each episode. So all one word, whenyouarehomeless.com. Um, and I'll just say this essay is published in the American Archivist. Um, so you can find it uh, in, in their titles among their archives. Is, I believe it came out in 2020 or 2019. Yes. 2020. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Alison. And again, congratulations uh, for your book. And I'm sure we'll speak again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to me today and for spending time uh, with this video. If you enjoyed the conversation, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, like, comment, and share it. If you'd like more information, please follow me on Twitter at Ruth underscore Mukwana. That is R-U-T-H underscore Mukwana. And also on my website, www.ruthmukwana.com. I'd like to thank my co-producer Jamal Swift and the Nomadic Band for the music. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs> Is Jamal there? <laughs>